Good afternoon, everyone. Good. Good afternoon. I'm Rory Lansman, Chair of the Committee on the Justice System. Uh, welcome to the fiscal 2019 preliminary budget hearing for the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and HRA's Office of Civil Justice. MOPJ plays a critical role in the cooperation and coordination of many of the city agencies involved in criminal justice and public safety. Its work provides critical resources, oversight, and policy direction for criminal justice in the city. Critically, MOCJ also manages the city's indigent defense system, which includes procuring contracts with legal services organizations. MOCJ also contracts with community-based organizations to provide a variety of criminal justice programs. The fiscal 2019 preliminary budget for MOCJ is $6.2 million, practically unchanged since the fiscal 2018 adopted budget. But that number does not remotely reflect MOCJ's influence, as MOCJ oversees the procurement, awarding, and monitoring of $395 million in criminal justice-related contracts each year. This includes $270 million annually for indigent criminal defense representation, $9.7 million for supervised release programs, $14.8 million for anti-gun violence initiatives, $11.4 million for reentry services, and $1.7 million for consultants to guide the city's implementation of Raise the Age, all for just for example. Prior to this hearing, we asked Mach J to offer testimony at this hearing concerning the projects managed or coordinated internally by MOCJ rather than contracted out to other organizations, any formulas or metrics used to determine funding allocations for the district attorney's offices, an update on the status of the RFP for criminal defense services, um, all budget items specifically supporting the mayor's plan to close Rikers Island, and all budget and budget request items specifically supporting implementation of Raise the Age broken out by agency. We're also interested in the current status of the online bail payment system and the new risk assessment tool, which was forthcoming, and any difficulties that have arisen with the transition of, the, um, of so many offenses covered by the Criminal Justice Reform Act from the criminal and summons courts to oath. After Mach J, we will give the Office of Civil Justice another go. Its fiscal 2019 preliminary budget is $118.5 million, a decrease of $10.7 million, primarily due to $23 million in city council initiative funding that the mayor did not include in his budget. OCJ's budget supports a variety of civil legal service contracts in the primary areas of anti-eviction, anti-harassment, and immigration defense. We also look forward to discussing OCJ's 2017 annual report and strategic plan for civil legal services. Before we hear testimony, let me thank our committee staff for their hard work. Steve Reister. Is it Reister or Reister? Reister. Reister. Nailed First it. one ever. Yeah. <laughs> and Sheila Johnson from the Finance Division and Brian Co. Crow and Casey Addison from the Legislative Division. I'd also like to mention my staff members, Rachel Kagan, Joshua Levitt, and Jordan Bieberman. So let's get going. Um, Director Glazer and whoever else will be testifying, if I can uh, swear you in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Terrific. Thank you very much, and please proceed. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Lansman. Uh, good afternoon uh, to you and to members of your staff. My name is Elizabeth Glazer, and I'm the director of the Mayor's Office uh, of criminal justice. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, I just wanted to introduce the folks sitting at the table with me. Uh, Dana Kaplan to my right, uh, who uh, heads up in our Raise the Age and uh, Rikers uh, uh, efforts, and Debbie Grummet, who's our budget director. Uh, I also have members of my senior staff here uh, who uh, are happy to answer questions if so needed. Uh, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice advises the Mayor on public safety strategy and together with partners inside and outside government develops and implement 
policies that promote safety and fairness and reduce unnecessary incarceration. In the last four years in New York City, we've seen an acceleration of the trends that have defined the public safety landscape in the city over the last three decades. While jail and prison populations around the country have increased, New York City's jail population has dropped by 22% in the last four years um, and by half since 1990, giving us the lowest incar incarceration rate of any large city and the steepest four-year decline in the size of our jail population since 1998. This decline in jail use has happened alongside record low crime. Major crime has fallen by 76% in the last 30 years and by 9% in the last four and 2017 was the safest year since we've been keeping records in, uh, through Comstat, with homicides down 13%, shootings down 21%, uh, and so on. New York City's experience is continued and unique proof that we can have both more safety and a smaller justice system. My office's goal is to invest public resources to help create the safest possible New York City with the smallest and fairest justice system. To drive toward this goal, we're pursuing an array of initiatives that can be grouped under three strategies, and I'd like to give an update on each of them today. The first strategy is partnering with New Yorkers to co-produce public safety. Historically, jurisdictions across the country have relied primarily on police to provide safety. But there are many other strategies beyond traditional law enforcement that can promote safety, such as enhancing trust between government and New Yorkers and building neighborhoods with expanded opportunities for work and play. Over the last four years, our office has served as the backbone for a number of these strategies. One way in which we're partnering with New Yorkers to co-produce public safety is through the Mayor's Office to Prevent Gun Violence and Eric Cumberbatch, who leads the, that office, is here today with us. This was launched in partnership with the council in 2016. New York City continues to have the lowest incidence of gun violence of any major U.S. city, and 2017 had the fewest shootings in over 30 years. Uh, the Office to Prevent Gun Violence oversees an expanded crisis management system, which includes teams of credible messengers who use the Cure Violence model to mediate conflicts on the street and connect high-risk individuals to services that can reduce the long-term risk of violence. This approach contributed to a 31% decline in shootings in the 17 highest violence precincts in New York City since the program launched in 2015. Uh, we're currently studying the results of the crisis management system in the catchment areas where it's operating. Uh, and in two studies that have, um, that have been finalized so far, uh, done by uh, researchers at John Jay, we've seen uh, important results. In the East New York catchment area, there were 15% fewer shootings than in a com comparable neighborhood without the program. And in the South Bronx area, there were 63% shoot fewer shootings uh, than in comparable neighborhoods. But as important as violence in reduction, there were also measurable changes in the attitude of the neighborhood, both in the use of violence and in confidence in the police. The f study found that young men living in neighborhoods with cure violence programs reported sharper uh, reductions in their willingness to use violence to settle dispute compared with young men without such programs and propensity to use violence in uh, petty disputes declined significantly only in cure violence areas, down about 20%. In addition, confidence in law enforcement rose about 22% in cure violence areas as against 14% in comparison areas. The second major initiative our office oversees uh, to promote safety in partnership with the public is the Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety, or MAP. And Amy Sanneman, who's the executive director of that program, is also here today. Um, in the last year, MAP implemented a neighborhood constat, which brings together residents of 15 public housing developments that drive violent crime in the city, together with both uh, an array of city agencies and local community-based uh, organizations. 
Together, they identify key public safety issues, review relevant data, and work hand in hand in developing solutions based on their combined expertise. Neighborhood Stat is now operating alongside the other components of the Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety, targeted law enforcement, physical improvements, and expanded opportunities for work and play uh, to create a model that's led to a reduction in index crime of 14% since MAP be began, compared to crime nitrowide, which declined 4%. The second major strategy my office oversees is creating a smaller, safer, and fairer jail system uh, and justice system in New York City. At its core, this is a matter of justice. No one should be detained who should, could safely remain in the community. But it's also a matter of pragmatism. The smaller our jail system, the easier it will be to close Rikers Island and create a justice system that reimagines and redoes the culture and purpose and location of jails. In the last year, New York City has made uh, the official decision to close uh, Rikers Island, and this is now the work each day of the government of New York City and the entities responsible for moving with urgency towards a smaller, safer, and fairer justice system. In the last year, we've made concrete progress the number of people in jail continues to fall, uh, as I mentioned, by 22% in the last four years and 5% in the last year alone. And for the first time in 30 years, the jail population uh, fell below 9,000 in December of 2017 and remains there today. Uh, this did not happen by accident. It is the result of intentional efforts by many to focus enforcement resources uh, on uh, public safety risks to operate alternatives to jail that earn the trust of judges and prosecutors and to work with New Yorkers to keep crime low. In the last year, we've partnered with gr working groups of judges, prosecutors, defendants, uh, defenders, and nonprofit program providers to launch several new programs uh, to accelerate safe reductions in the jail population. These include new behavioral health services for defendants assigned to supervised release, uh, a pretrial community-based alternative to jail program that's diverted over 7,000 people from jail since launching in March of 2016, a new program that replaces short jail sentences with community-based sanctions uh, that address issues like housing and employment insecurity, and 55 transitional housing beds uh, designated for women to allow them to remain in the community while awaiting trial. <coughs> Additionally, we've continued our partnership with all parts of the criminal justice system to reduce case processing delays. A few examples of the results, the number of people detained on misdemeanor charges is down 34 percent since 2013. The number of people detained on bail 2,000 and less is down by 60 percent since that same time period and the number of people in custody with cases pending for longer than three years is down 53% since April of 2015, uh, when the city, courts, DAs, and defenders launched a joint initiative to reduce case processing delays. Notably, the only population in the jail that has seen an increase is the population of people uh, incarcerated on state parole violations up 32% since uh, the beginning of 2014. This population is one illustration of the extent to which reducing the number of people in jail in New York City is a shared responsibility, one that requires the partnership of the state, the court system, the DAs, defenders, and nonprofit providers, uh, as well as New Yorkers themselves. While we have reason to be optimistic about the progress to date, the shared um, and the shared commitment to keep driving down the jail population, we should note that as the number of people in jail continues to go down, we will be left with a smaller number of people detained on more violent charges. And reaching our goal of 5,000 people in jail will require the sustained partnership of all the entities and all the people that I've mentioned. We launch uh, the Justice Implementation Task Force to ensure that we will not just close Rikers Island but replace it with a changed system that is smaller, safer, and fairer. Zach Carter, the Corporation Counsel for the City of New York, and I chair this task force, uh, which brings together 
all of the entities from inside and outside government with decision-making authority, implementation oversight, and expertise on the key topics uh, to creating a smaller, safer, and justice, uh, justice system. A system that would allow for, among other important gains, the eventual closing of Rikers Island. The task force includes leaders whose decisions affect the size of our jail population, uh, police, prosecutors, defenders, state courts, corrections, probation, service providers, all of whom are working with us to identify and implement strategies to reduce the size of the jail population safely. Task force members also have responsibility for advising on the best ways to improve safety and opportunity for people inside the jails and to design modern jail facilities. The over 75 leaders and experts who have joined the task force are meeting regularly and creating a coordinated mechanism to shape and implement system changes. We announced plans to close the first jail on Rikers Island this summer and have reached an agreement to site new jails uh, in the boroughs. In partnership with the City Council, the City has identified the proposed sites for four borough-based uh, detention facilities, including the three existing DOC facilities in Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan. In the Bronx, the site of the current uh, Police Department tow pound uh, was selected for a number of reasons, including its proximity <coughs> to public transportation, the courthouse, the fact that it's a city-owned property, so it will not delay our commitment to close Rikers Island, and because it has sufficient space to support a facility to house approximately one quarter of the total projected population in jail. A consulting team led by Perkins Easton, Eastman has begun work on a master plan for the scope of these borough-based facilities, and public community meetings will begin in early April in each borough <coughs> to ensure that neighborhood and community input is integrated into the city's plan, including the perspectives of neighborhood residents, correctional officers, people in detention, and their loved ones and others. All of these people are essential so that we design jails that are both civic, uh, that both are civic assets and provide safety and dignity to people who are incarcerated and people who work inside of the jails. While the city has an initial investment of a billion dollars in new jail facilities, the completion of the master plan in uh, December of 2018 will allow for a determination of the full cost of the project. Our target is to also have ULERP certification by the end of the year, putting us uh, on an aggressive schedule to advance this critical commitment. The third major strategy my office is working on is promoting fairness. A successful public safety system is not measured only in terms of quantity, how much crime or how many people in jail, but also by the quality of justice. We advance several initiatives to pr promote this, lightening the touch of enforcement while still ensuring quality of life. In the last year, in partnership with the City Council and other justice system actors, uh, we've taken a number of steps to prevent minor offenses from snowballing into arrests and detention. Uh, those kinds of actions can imperil a person's job or housing. The Criminal Justice Reform Act, uh, which went into effect on June 13th of last year, substituted civil tickets for criminal summonses for low-level offenses, like having an open container or littering in most instances, and has reduced summonses for these offenses by more than 90%. In addition, the city cut the number of criminal summonses by 50%, between 2013 and 2017, uh, excluding offenses now punished with civil tickets under the CJRA. The mayor's office also worked with the four district attorneys to dismiss 644,000 outstanding warrants for minor offenses like drinking alcohol in public or entering a park after hours. In addition to proportionate enforcement, the city is working to make small common sense fixes that will enhance compliance with the law for example, the city worked with a behavioral e economics firm to redesign the criminal summons form to make it more accessible to New Yorkers and to begin sending text message reminders for court dates. Together, these interventions decreased rates of failure to appear in court by 36%. Last year, uh, in partnership with the First Lady uh, and the Police Commissioner and the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence, our office launched the Domestic Violence Task Force. 
For years, the overall homicide, number of homicides in New York City has fallen, while the number of homicides linked to domestic violence has remained stagnant. To ensure that all New Yorkers live in a city that's becoming safer, the Domestic Violence Task Force is implementing over uh, $10 million in annual investments to reduce domestic violence by intervening as early as possible, enhancing pathways to safety for survivors, and ensuring swift, effective, and lasting enforcement to hold abusers accountable. While the work is in its beginning phase, we're heartened that domestic violence crime is down 8% compared to this time last year. Finally, I'd like to provide a brief update uh, to the Council on the City's efforts to implement Raise the Age, uh, the state legislation to treat 16 and 17 year olds as juveniles within the criminal justice system, a change long sought and advocated for by the city. My office is leading a planning process with the participation of the relevant city agencies, the courts, DAs, defenders, and nonprofit providers. We are all uh, planning for the significant increase of these young people into the family court system, the development of adolescent offender parts, a full continuum of diversion opportunities and community-based programs, and the identification and preparation of juvenile justice facilities to house this expanded population. As we've shared in the past, there is currently approximately $300 million in capital funding allocated to improve these sites and work is well underway at Crossroads and Horizon, the city's two existing juvenile uh, detention facilities. We continue to advocate aggressively to the state for the use of New York's, the New York State uh, Office of Children and Family Services facility, Ella McQueen, to have sufficient capacity to house safely all of the adolescents that are both in the current juvenile justice system and that are required to be off of Rikers Island by October of 2018. OMB is currently working with the agencies on the full funding needs required for Raise the Age implementation for discussion within the context of the executive budget. I'm grateful to the City Council and to all our other partners who work with us in implementing this work, knowing that it is complicated and time consuming. But with this shared responsibility and shared effort, we have a rare and real opportunity to construct a smaller, safer, and fairer justice system in New York City that will endure. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, let me first uh, acknowledge that we have been joined by Council Members Rose, uh, Powers, and Ulrich. And um, <clears throat> let me first ask you, just so we have an appreciation of the, the scope of Mach J's uh, work, you went through a number of uh, programs, task forces, and other things that, that Mach J is in involved with. One of the things that we asked you for in our in our letter is just an itemization of all the projects that Mach J is, is coordinating and, and, and working on. Uh, other than what you've given us, is, is there any other projects that you're working on? And, and maybe if you can give us just the briefest of description, just sure. so we have the, the whole picture. Sure. So um, much of it is up on our website. Uh, some of it is part of our daily work. So. Um, some things are more formalized than others. I mentioned the Rikers Task Force, the Raise the Age Implementation uh, Map, the Office to Prevent Gun Violence. Uh, we have two projects uh, grouped under what we call Justice Reboot. One is related to expediting case delay that we started with then Chief Judge Lippman and the five DAs and uh, the heads of the defenders organizations a couple of years ago. Uh, the second is around summons reform, and I talked a little bit about that in my testimony. Um, and we also coordinate um, uh, effort around, around gun violence separate from Eric's office um, called Project Fast Track, um, which again brings together um, the DAs, uh, the police department, uh, the medical examiner's office, uh, probation, a number of others. Uh, to really sort of focus on the day-to-day -day of uh, the investigation and prosecution of gun crimes. Uh, we have a group of about 60-ish um, entities from both inside and outside government uh, who are grouped under the Diversion and Reentry uh, Council. And through those subcommittees, we drive much of the work related to um, 
uh, population reduction, uh, mental health issues, and other things. Uh, we, uh, I already uh, referred to in my testimony, the Domestic Violence Task Force. So that's a sort of taste of some of the stuff we do. But our, our everyday work is the work of coordinating multiple agencies, um, and both inside and outside of government. Other than what you've given us, is there is there any other project or task force or, or specific collaboration? I, I know on a daily basis you're getting calls from all sorts of agencies and you have your, appropriately, I hope, your finger in so many different criminal justice related matters, but is there any other any other initiative, anything with a with a fancy name or, or title or, 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 or effort going on that that you haven't given us? So we also And it's not a trick question, that's not like I'm yeah, looking no, for Yeah, no, I mean uh, uh, one often f forgets the most amazing thing. So, um, uh, so we also have in my office the Office uh, of Special Enforcement, and Christian Klossner is here, who heads up that office. Um, that uh, is perhaps sort of a very good representation of the way my office works. So that uh, consists of an array of folks um, detailed to my office from the Department of Buildings, Sanitation, Fire Department, Police Department, uh, the Sheriff's Office, and others. Um, I, so there are a lot of other things. Some are big, some are small, some are more formalized, some are less formalized. This is sort of the more formalized list. Okay, great. Um, so we've also been joined by Council Member uh, Maisel. So let, I, I want to talk about, um, there's a budget hearing, so I want to talk about some money things. Because um, we've, we've had hearings on Justice Reboot, and we might have a hearing on, on Fast Track, because we're interested in what the status is with the gun court and, and all of that. Lots of policy things to, to talk about with Mach J. Um, but I want to try to just focus on, on, on the money here. So last week, or whatever it was, two weeks ago, we had the DAs, we had the public defenders, um, and, and they had specific uh, budget issues. So let's, let's start with the, the DAs, if, if we can. And the big interest that I have and others have has to do with how does the, the, the city, how does the mayor come up with the numbers that are put in the preliminary budget for the district attorney's offices, whether or not there's um, fairness or, or some rationality behind it, and then a big issue of, of salary for assistance. All of the offices complain that they are losing uh, young to mid-level assistance, to, in particular other government agencies, in some cases other, other city agencies. So, so just by, by way of background, our read of the, the mayor's preliminary budget for the district attorneys is 140 million for Manhattan, 97 for Brooklyn, 72 for Bronx, 64 for Queens, and 14 uh, for Staten Island. Um, and there are some very significant disparities, obviously just in, in the face of the numbers that I, that I read there. But for example, Queens, which you know, I confess to being a little partial to, 17. Not Staten Island? Well, I got to leave that to you, Council. <laughs> um, there's a, there's a $17 million difference in what the salaries, or the personnel budget is for Queens at $52 million. And for example, $70 million in the Bronx. That's, that's, as I said, a $17 million difference. And when you look at Brooklyn and Manhattan, it gets even, it gets even more significant. And, and, and what that means on the ground is, for example, Queens has 318 assistant district attorneys, ADAs, 318. The Bronx is 565, Brooklyn is 526, Manhattan is 598. I, I'm not going to ask you to account for every discrepancy between each office. But, but let's start with how does the mayor arrive at what should be the budget of each office? Is there a formula? Is there a rationale? And, um, and then we can go from, go from there. So I think what you're looking at is what the baseline budget is, meaning okay. that it's not as if this is now an extra X million coming in, but this is what the budget 
is proposed. So this yes. is sort of the running, the day-to-day -day running of the office. Yes. So um, I think the first thing I'd like to do is just sort of frame this discussion a little bit uh, as to what the last four years have looked like for these DAs. And I don't think that there has been as large an increase in DA's budgets um, previously as there has been in the last four years. Uh, so just to give you a sense, uh, it's been anywhere from 16% increase to a 68% increase. Uh, and obviously percentages can sometimes be uh, misleading because if it's off of a low base, but there has been a significant increase in the DA's budget. There is no formula with respect to how we uh, address what the DA's needs are. Um, that is part of a conversation that we have with each DA's offices based on what their concerns are. So to give you sort of some examples, um, when DA Clark first came in, uh, she proposed a very substantial reorganization of her office and a transfer to the vertical prosecution system, uh, which we funded. Uh, she was interested in having a Rikers Bureau uh, to address cases coming out of Rikers, and we funded that. Staten Island wanted a new DV unit, et cetera. So each, each DA's office comes up with what their needs are, um, and we, uh, in a conversation with them, determine what those needs are uh, in the context of the whole budget. So se several of the DA's told me that um, I guess over the past couple of years, they've been sending data to Mock J, um, which, which they thought was going to result in some kind of analysis or, or some kind of um, a, a final look or a hard look at how the offices are, are funding. As, as you said, the DA's office funding has gone up each of their first, their last four years. We've, we've voted for them. We've advocated for some of them particularly when the Judge Clark became the DA, we wanted to give her the opportunity to, to start fresh and, and, and change that office. So, ha, is there any ongoing collection of data from the DAs and any, any plan? So the DA's offices are very variable. Um, as part of, um, of uh, uh, something called the Anti-Violence Initiative uh, that we started about two years ago, um, we allocated about $10 million to the five DA's offices um, with a proposal that they determine among themselves how to allocate it. Uh, they decided to divide it up equally among themselves. In exchange for that, we suggested a number of different things, including the quarterly provision of data. Each of the DA's offices is quite variable in their ability to actually produce data. I think it's a frustration for them also. Um, and we have then quarterly meetings um, with them uh, to look at what, what that's showing us, usually in the context of our Project Fast Track meetings. So <clears throat> I understand that each um, office has its own unique needs and, a, and agenda, and, it, and it's very heartening to hear the district attorneys come and testify um, to some degree or competing with each other to be who's a bigger criminal justice reformer. Um, it's, it's just a sea change in, in hearing district attorneys talk about what they do. Um, but those things cost money. So, you know, Staten Island wants to do a conviction integrity review unit and the DA Gonzalez wants to do vertical prosecutions. But one of the, th and, I, and I guess they to some extent have to haggle with the council and the mayor over resources for that. But one consistent theme, as I, as I mentioned earlier, is the salary that they're able to pay their assistants. And meeting with Judge Clark and in her own testimony, we gave her all this money to hire assistants. She hired them, and now she can't keep them after three, four, five years because they're going to, specifically mentioned often, is the law department, Department of Education, Department of Correction, in the court system, being a court attorney, you make more than being an assistant DA. It, it, can anything be done in terms of thinking about how across the five DAs there can be some city commitment for salary parity, that the, the basic 
you know, here's our people are going to get paid um, a salary that is not going to uh, let them get poached or, or compel them to provide for their own families to jump to other city agencies. Can can Mock J look at so that this year? I, I would like to just frame this a little bit. Let, let me just read you a few things. Um, in this administration, the Bronx has received an additional $22 million, up 43%. Brooklyn has received an additional $13 million, up 16%. Manhattan has received another $18 million, up 22%. Queens has received an additional $15 million, up 31%. Staten Island has received an additional $6 million, up 68%. Each DA has discretion within their budget as to how to allocate things. Uh, and you read off earlier essentially what their baseline budgets are. So, uh, so point number one is there has been an enormous increase in the DA's budgets. For things that we think are absolutely worthy and the DA's are definitely working on all those things. Um, the second point is we are now living in a time of constrained budgets. We are not where we were even last year or the year before or the year before that. So I think the time has come for the DA's themselves to look within their own offices and to determine how they want to arrange parity. Um, because those things, even if we were to arrange with the DAs that everybody started at the same salary, within a year that could be changed and as, as is well within their right and their, um, and their authority and what they should do to run their offices, that they decide to change the starting salaries and instead use it for bonuses for retention or for something else that different in each office they need. So right now, um, we are not considering uh, salary adjustments or an additional infusion of money for the DAs uh, for salary parity. Well, let me ask you the big question. We, we want the DAs to do all these reformy things. We want them to have conviction integrity units. We want them to um, have the HOPE program and the CLEAR program and, and or the alternatives to incarceration and the alternatives to detention and, and all of these things, if you look through and what the DAs were asking for, it's like one great reform after, after, the, after the other. Can, is, it, is it fair for the city, is it fair for us, the mayor, the council, to expect these reform things of these DAs but not give them the resources to do those things and also pay their people comparable to other city attorneys. Because it, it sounds like, I, I get it, they set the salaries of their assistants. They could pay them more, but then they're not going to have this HOPE program or they're not going to have that. Is, is well, I would take issue with that. So, I mean, so, tell, so me, tell me your view so, of that. So just yesterday, uh, we funded a HOPE pro program in the Bronx. We have funded... Uh, McMahon's HOPE program and evaluation in Staten Island. So with respect to particular issues um, and with respect to this long list of things that I've uh, read off, uh, I think that the city has really supported the DAs in the important things that they want to do. Um, of course, their, their um, job is to pursue justice. And that's what they're doing. And they're thinking about things every single day. But it seems to me that those things should be able to be done it, when, we, when we're talking about sort of something like salary parity within the context um, of their budgets. Uh, and I would also note uh, that it is not as if we're living in a time of a crime boom. We're living over the last four years uh, in a time when misdemeanor arrests have dropped by 30%. So the volume of cases actually going in um, has been reduced. So I think that there is opportunity to work within what has been, I believe, quite a generous infusion of money to the DA's offices. I, I don't dispute the, the generous infusion because I, I voted for them. Um, and I want to move off from this, and, and I want to get to the other 
side of the, the equation, the public defenders and the, the difficulties that, that they're having. But I just want to make the, the observation that we're the ones demanding of the DAs to do all these other things beyond meat and potato, prosecuting people and putting them in jail. And I acknowledge that we have given them money to do these other things. It does not look like though we have given them more money to do the basics of paying their so their 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 ADAs well enough to, to keep them. It's undeniable that they all have so retention problems. So there are two problems. things that you're raising there. Yeah. One is how they're paying them, and two whether or not we're paying them enough to do reforms. And I would say two things to that. To the second one, what I've already said with respect to it is within their discretion as to how they allocate their budget. Times are tough. Not so tough, <laughs> but it's that's sort of that's what they have to do as managers of their office. But the second thing I would say is I would so take issue with your uh, characterization that we're asking the DAs to do something extra when we ask them to, and it's not just us; they want to do this too. When we ask them to exercise their prosecutorial discretion. Uh, in a way that leads to a smaller, safer, and fairer system. This is something they want to do, too. That's not an extra money thing. That is something that is part of their job. No, but, but those things, uh, I fundamentally agree, but those things do cost money. If, if you're going to have a conviction integrity review unit, you have to assign ADAs to that and staff to, to that. If you're going to have, and one thing that Judge Clark uh, brought up, if you're going to ask, going to ask us to do more in terms of voluntary disclosure and not be constrained or not adhere to the, the very, very restrictive state disclosure laws, well, we need uh, paralegals or assistants who are able to, to review those documents. So um, the, the things that they ought to be doing, which we want them to do and which we think are inherent in, in doing justice, which is their job, do cost extra money, and we've and we've been funding that. It just seems as if the the nuts and bolts of being able to pay assistance, so they 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 stick around beyond their three or four year tour of duty, has has lagged behind. But so, uh, I don't. Retention is important, uh, and you have my view on yes. what potentially they can do, and obviously we have had very open and productive uh, discussions with them over the last four years about funding and look forward to doing the same. Good. All right, so let, let's turn to the public defenders because that's, uh, they're not five independently elected officials. They live under the contract that we um, put them under and their testimony and my conversations with them reflect um, or indicate that they're having a very, very tough time. Um, and it seems like the city, Mach J, has really underestimated the, the cost of the city's indigent defense requirements, and, and particularly or le the aspirations that we all had for um, a new contract for, for that included you know, a, a whole host of criminal justice reform type requirements. At the hearing, the public defenders testified to a, a long chronology of trying to comply with the city's, respond to the city's request for proposals for a new indigent defense contract, um, investing resources in that um, effort, um, investing resources actually in, in hiring staff to meet those requirements. It's a process that seemed to have started back in August of 2016. I think we're on the second extension, the first ex we're, the we're still in their contract period. Well, uh, the contract's been extended, no? We're in the contract period right now. As of July 1, there will be a six month extension. We anticipate starting mm -hmm. their new contract in January. Okay, and I think that they testified or they told us that, that they were told that there was gonna be, the six months extension was gonna be a year long extension. No. Here's the chronology that, that we got. You tell us what's wrong. In August of 2016, Mach J issued a concept paper for an RFP for $150 million a year 
um, which included adding homicides, which there was some debate about whether that was a good idea or not a good idea, but, but things that we really liked, like enhancing holistic wraparound services with additional social workers, immigration specialists, and civil action attorneys, all the things that, that the council was very happy about, and obviously you put in the RFP, you believed in it as well. In September of 16, the defenders issued a joint response to the concept paper. In December of 16, Mock J issued an RF, a formal RFP with a due date of February 2017 and with an expected start date of July of 2017. In June of 2017, Mock J told the defendants that the new contract would start in July of 2018. So that's what I was referring to. That was what I was referring to by the, by the extension. But the extension or that added period living under the, the current contract or the old contract, if you want to phrase it, didn't include any increases for escalations such as rent, health care, or any of the collectively bargained increases that the defenders are obligated to pay. In August of 17, Mock J asked for, quote, best and final offers for new contracts. Mock J provided staffing ratios and caseload numbers that the defenders were asked to submit budgets for. These included increase in social workers, investigators, immigration specialists, civil action attorneys, all things that we're, you know, cheering you on. Um, and the de defenders started ramping up, they testified, to be able to re be ready for the July, um, for, for, the, for the start date. They, they were told in 2017 November 2017, they would, they would get a final plan from Mach J. They've hired these third year law students. They're not getting any increases in, in their existing um, contract. And then they were told that the final plan would be released in February. And then in early March this year, this early this month, Mach J told the defenders that they would be seeking another six months extension so that the new contract wouldn't begin um, until January 1st, 2019, and that the extension that they would be living under would, again, not cover any cost increases for rent, health care, or collectively a bargained increases for union staff. And then in, in the middle of this month, mid-March, Mock J told defenders that the six months extension would likely be a one-year extension. Yep. So, so that's the chronology we got. Yeah. What, what, what's so, what's no. the current status so, of the RFP? Here's what the current status okay. is. Uh, we're beginning negotiations with them to close on this. Um, we obviously can't begin negotiations. We personally, Mach J does not hold the purse strings to the city. So we need to uh, arrange that with OMB. Um, we're now ready to begin that negotiation. Um, and I think we're starting at the end of this week, beginning of next week. Next week, so um, so that's where we are. Um, we have a six-month extension to start in uh, January, with a ramp-up starting in October of this year. So, so it's your anticipation that the the new FR the RFP will turn into contracts that will begin in in January of nineteen. Am I Correct. Right. Yeah, and and. In the meantime, the defenders tell us that they are um, bleeding money, that they're, they've not had an increase since the current contract has been through its extensions, and that they've had to expend resources in anticipation of the new contract starting, which it did not. So is there any contemplation or anything in the budget, in this budget, that helps them out between now and when that new contract would kick in in, in, in January. They, they gave us a number at the last hearing, I think, of almost um, $19 million, that they are in the red, the group of them. So that is a new number to me. Uh, yeah, I, I have that for one of the other ones. Okay. So I have $18,755,991. Someone's figured this out, at least from their perspective. Is there anything in the budget at all, the mayor's preliminary budget, that would help them get through to January? Anything added? We, we don't see that there is. 
So I think there are a number of things that still need to be worked out for the executive budget. Um, we have um, we have the authorization to begin to start in the negotiations. So with respect to the to the contract itself, um, I think we have a path forward. With respect to this 19 million, which as I say is a new number to me, uh, that is something that we'll have to talk to them about next week. Uh, but I can't promise what <laughs> what's going to happen in the executive budget since well, I just heard this number today. They're, they're coming with a big bill, so now you now now you know. I, I am delighted to meet right. with them. And and are there any res and I don't know exactly how this works when you're you've got a mayor's budget but you're still negotiating a contract but that contract will need to be paid within the fiscal year that we're still we're still budgeting come January 1st if it all works <laughs> out and there's there's a new contract in order it seems in order to meet the um, the goals of the RFP the laudable goals of the RFP um, it needs to be a very substantial increase in the annual expenditure for the, those those services. Is, is there anything in the preliminary budget that anticipates that significant increase, or, or or does that you can add that at some later point, or has Mark J or, or OMB or someone in the city said, listen, we these were these are great ideas that we had, very aspirational, but we can't afford that. We're just we're just going to keep doing so what we're doing. Part of beginning the negotiations is that we have um, we have a budget within which to work and to work through with the uh, with the defenders, uh, and there will be an increase. Um, but we're starting those negotiations next week. Got it. Okay. I will have other questions on other issues, but I, my colleagues are here, and they might have questions as as well. Do we have a list? Powers. Keith Powers. Hello, thank you. And sorry, if we could put five minutes on the clock. I'm gonna do my best to take less than five, but you never know. <laughs> I just want a couple questions that came up at the Criminal Justice Committee meeting sure. uh, last week that uh, we were told to refer to Mock J, so I'm here to refer to Mock J. We're here. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, one of the questions that came up was just timeline on the Rikers um, siting of new facilities. Yep and then also the Perkman's Yeast study. Yep. And so I'll just do these in pieces. The Perkman's Yeast study is due to be is completed later end, this year. End of this year, yeah. When is that supposed to be done? So at the end of this year. So yeah. end of this year. Yeah, yeah. And then the certification for ULER begins? It, the, the target for certification is also to be complete by the end of this year. It, which one happens first if you, if, or are they say same we time? We are running on uh, concurrent timelines in which obviously the preliminary feedback that we get back from the master plan is something that we'll be looking at, but uh, both of those things will happen by the end of this year and one timing isn't dependent on the other. I, that's my question. We don't need Perkman's Yeast study to be completed in order to certify a Euler process for new facilities. That it strikes me as both of them will be complete by the end of this year. And so uh, I think we anticipate that we are getting that information back from the Perkins Eastman study along the way to inform uh, what will be the ULERP certification and the environmental impact assessment and all of that work is moving ahead. But, uh, you know, there's no, the, the target for both of those is by the end of the year. The contract for the Perkins Eastman is a 10 month uh, timeline. So, you know, we've, that contract is registered and the work has begun. And is there any piece of information out of the study that you need for ULERP? So we will be doing environmental testing, uh, and so certainly that will be part of uh, the environmental assessment. So is it, yeah, that's a yes. yes. For, okay, <laughs> and and design. You don't necessarily, I guess, have to put all the design stuff into the ULERP, but certainly I would think there's some information that you would need. I I'm just concerned that we are on two timelines. So either we are spending money on a study that will not inform the Euler process for the new facilities, or we are spending money for something that will inform it and we're not, our timelines are off. I think you're telling me I'm wrong on A and B and that we can go into ULERP and then still use the design out of the, out of the report to inform the building of them, I guess, the final design? 
So this is something I've struggled with too and have had to have it explained to me a number of times. So it's not as if at the end of this year we're going to have a perfectly designed jail with electrical outlet you know, renderings, sure, right? right. Um, what we will have, which will permit the ULERP to go forward, is that we'll know enough about how big the buildings will be, what will ha be happening inside it, um, what kind of traffic impact it will have, um, what some sort of rough idea is of sort of the massing studies. So it's not going to be architecturally designed, but it will be, you will functionally know um, how big, what kinds of things are gonna happen, what kinds of programs inside each building. Yeah, I, I would just note that if I was a low, I'm, and I support and I'm proud to have local members who are who are supportive of, of the facilities and are so they mm -hmm. have to go to their communities and talk to them, but I would certainly would want to see something of a design and a final product that's being proposed before heading into a community conversation and yeah. talking about size and scope and impact totally. and things like that. And I think so that- I, I, All I'm suggesting is that there are gonna be renderings, Okay. but we still have to go through the process of hiring an architect and, and doing the actual design of everything inside. And Perkman's East won't do the design? No. Okay. Um, so- It won't do the architect. Well, to the architectural design, design. right? Okay, <laughs> I've still sometimes con I'm confused about that the all yeah, all yeah. purpose of that study, but I just want to move on to Ellen McQueen for for a minute. Um, the city saying we want it. I've heard the state say they're willing to give it to us. Can you let us know where that stands and if, like many things, we often I hear that often we want yeah. Ellen to give but we don't get. And so, what's the what's the uh, update on that and also what would it be used for if we did take it over I use my time no I'm happy to that. answer that question yeah, uh, yeah if yeah. are we permitted to answer mm -hmm. do you want to so uh, uh, so the use of Ellen McQueen I'll start with it is our hope is that it would act as an intake facility which is it is currently an OCFS reception center We've been involved in multiple conversations uh, with the state on this, from the mayor to you know Liz and the, our state legislative affairs office. There's been requested both uh, in letter and in written conversation, and we do have reasons to be optimistic. It's in the governor's budget that there would you know be the potential closing of that facility, uh, and we'll know that as soon as you know by April 1st. And so. I think you know we have identified that as the best possible viable um, path forward, and one that would provide the you know best environment for young people between Crossroads Horizon and Ella McQueen. So we will continue to communicate with the state on this, but you know that's that's our remains our plan, and we will have additional information soon with the budget. Hey, so just one last question. On, sorry, in the back. The, April, it sounds like April for this is all budget, so mm -hmm. April first. And am I correct saying that the state has said they're willing to give it to you, or you're still waiting for that? The We're, state being all three sides for sure. Yes. But has the governor's office expressed to you that they're interested or willing? We are still waiting for a formal notification or of a notification that that facility is something that we will be able to use. So that's a top priority for the city. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Councilmember Rose. Thank you. Um, the budget now includes a 3.9 million um, for the expansion of crisis management systems to um, four new catchment areas and four new precincts. Um, and the, the council had requested that um, a, a pair of unit of appropriations be attributed for the office of, to prevent gun violence. So um, as your funding increases for the Office of Crisis Management System, system um, continues to increase, um, what efforts are you uh, going to make to, um, to do dedicated units of appropriations for, so, um, you so may, that there's better yeah. transparency? It, it covers, right now it covers a, a broad spectrum. And so, um, so are there any 
efforts to do dedicated units of appropriation. So for council, uh, it, uh, you may know from the blank look on my face that I actually don't know what a dedicated unit of appropriation is and I apologize, but okay. can you tell me and then Okay. Eric, you may know. Um, Maybe you should answer this question. Or what what we say. Eric, would you? I, I prefer that you just give the definition. And then, I can uh, and then I'll defer to Eric to actually <laughs> answer the question. And apologies that I don't know that. In, in, in the budget, um, we see that there are, um, there are item lines. There are line items, um, but they're rather vague. And they don't indicate what amount is being attributed to like each which of precinct the, or something the like units that. that are being funded. Ah, and, um, okay. and so there's not much transparency. I and see. it leads to um, council not being able to determine where the money is going I specifically and if it's going where we have asked it. for it to go. Do you know the answer? It's not mm -hmm. really within my discretion, so it's a conversation that is larger in the budget. Obviously. Is it a conversation that you have um, have at least broached, or is it on your agenda to do so? We just have to. This is something we need to talk through with OMB and the mayor's office. So I, what I'm trying to get you to say is that you there's a commitment to have that conversation with OMB. Yes, absolutely, yeah. we can have that conversation. Okay. Now that we know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and um, y y we know that there's going to be some impact uh, to the budget based on federal um, budget cuts. Um, but I noticed that you have 39 positions that's attributed to Mock J's headcount that um, come um, that are federal justice assistance grant, yeah. uh, one point five million. Yeah. Um, what you know, what is your forecast? What do you think you know the probability of the funding is uh, coming is going to be? And if not, what contingencies are you making? So we don't know. Um, I think we're in the mm -hmm. position that right. everybody no one else, knows. no one knows. So and what so is that's, the contingency? Yeah, yeah. So that's actually a conversation that we're having with OMB right now uh, to understand uh, what do we do um, if those lines don't come through, you know, if that money doesn't come through for those lines. So I don't have an answer on that yet. Um, is there, um, knowing that it's 1.5 million, has there been a request made to supplement that in your budget? Right, so we, we submit what our needs are, and so we flagged for OMB that this, we're in jeopardy here. Um, we may not be in jeopardy, but we wanted to make sure it's on their radar um, as they consider the city's budget. Okay. Yeah. And what amount um, in, in this uh, fiscal year 19 budget is allocated for mental health services for currently incarcerated or at risk, at risk youth and their families, um, not including the expedited mental competency exams. So, and not including not not paid, including those so special what other programs. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you have a number on that? We may not have that number right at hand, but I'm happy. Can you get to, that for to get, get that for you? Okay. Yep. Thank you. And my time is just about up, so thank you. Well, look, look if, you have, if you have another one, council member. Yeah, good, thank you very much. Um, so let me ask you about the, the jail siting issue. And again, I don't want to be overly parochial, but if you recall, a few years ago, we were sitting in, I think, the Queensborough President's office, mm -hmm. talking about the needs of the Queens District Attorney's office mm -hmm. for additional space. and their interest in using the Queen's House of Detention. Um, is there a possibility to have a conversation, a favorite word of conversation, it doesn't, it doesn't cost anything to have mm -hmm. a conversation, um, or any openness from your perspective as a policy matter to, to see if we can include the expansion of the Queen's DA's office in the concept 
for what the new Queen's House of Detention mm -hmm. is gonna, gonna look like? Is yeah, that so the Queen's DA has already reached out on this issue, um, and I think it's absolutely <coughs> worth a conversation. I think part of what the whole scoping study is right now is to understand, um, as we were talking to the councilman earlier, um, what is in the building that is rehabbed or built um, on that site. So I think that is a totally fair conversation to have. So, so how do we have that, that conversation? How do I get that into the, how do I get my two cents in, in on that? Would it be appropriate so for me to meet with these, are they meeting with council members to get their input into this vision that they're yeah. formulating? Yeah. Uh, we can absolutely Maybe. follow up to make sure that we have uh, a meeting with you. But yes, the, the CPSC consultants will be doing meetings with all interested stakeholders and we'll make sure that you can be part of that conversation. Good, I, I, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, let's move to, to our personal favorite topic of online bail. Mm -hmm. And if you could tell us where we are with, with that. Um, sure. The mayor's campaign website says that we have an online bail system and I was surprised to, to read that. But um, yeah, the de Blasio administration created an online bail payment system, et cetera, et cetera. So I know you're not so responsible for the campaign website, but maybe there's something I didn't know. Yeah, I don't know what you're referring to, so, um, or if I have control over it, but I can tell you what the update is. Um, so we've been, uh, I think when we last spoke, I told you that we were starting testing on the system, which we've been doing in a series of sprints um, that's just about done and has gone well. Um, we still anticipate uh, an April start. Um, we've been uh, setting up training with all the various components uh, and actors in the system who are going to need to learn how to operate it. Um, and. Uh, we anticipate, barring any unforeseen uh, issues, that we will be starting in April. April 2018. Correct. Okay. How are we doing on the updated risk assessment? I understand that part of the mayor's closed Rikers plan anticipates that the new risk assessment will reduce Rikers population by 1,700 beds a year, which mm -hmm. we're very happy to, to see. We've been hearing about the risk assessment for some time. Can you mm -hmm. just give us an update on where that is, sure. when it will be rolled out? Sure. So um, you may or may not know that it's been a long time since we've done a risk assessment instrument for the city, a new one, and that, in fact, the risk assessment instrument that we have is based on three months of data dating from the 1990s, Um, I'm advised that I misspoke, that, that I said 1,700 beds. Oh, it's 700. 710. Ish. Yeah. Thank exactly. you. Everybody else caught it, but they didn't want to say anything. <laughs> we would have corrected the record afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so the first and most important thing is that we actually have a risk assessment instrument that's based on current data, and that's based then more on more than just the 90 days that our current risk assessment instrument is based on. So um, the work of, the significant work of, um, of the past, the recent past, has been to actually get those data sets, to clean the data sets, to match them from multiple, multiple different uh, agencies and actors, um, and to begin building um, various versions of what the tool would look like so that we can test it in different ways. Uh, we also have had uh, quite an active um, research advisory group that is populated by researchers from across the country and from across different points of view because we think it's very important to have that kind of input. Um, and I were hopeful that um, by the end of this year we'll be rolling out the FTA tool. I, I assume that part of the, the, the review and testing is, is concerns have been raised about making sure that it is not in any way biased, either yeah. certainly not explicitly but implicitly, um, that uh, there would be no racial bias in it. Well, just give people a sense of, of comfort how you're looking to make sure that that's 
not going to be allowed to seep into this aspect of yeah. the criminal justice system as it is in, in almost every other. Yeah, no, it's an absolutely know. crucial yeah. thing that we be able to provide um, a guide and assistance to judges that is fair uh, and has no racial bias uh, or limits racial bias as much as possibly can. Um, and that's the reason why we've assembled um, both the group of researchers that are working now on the actual building and testing of the tool and the group of researchers who um, have access to the data and are able to really test it and test our assumptions at every step of the way. Um, but that's a central concern for us. Um, I want to ask you about supervised release because it is the biggest chunk, it seems to be the biggest chunk of, um, of bed reduction for, for Rikers Island. Can you tell us um, how many uh, people are being served by supervised release a year currently, um, what the mayor's budget does to increase supervised release funding, and how many additional people are expected to be served as a result of that funding? So um, we have approximately $11 million supporting supervised release now. Um, that serves, um, uh, when we started, it was about 3,300 people a year, or it's not people, it's actually um, spaces. So it's more people than that, but we count it as slots because that's how it translates into bed days. So, um, so 3,300 cases, let's put it that way, is a it, year. Is it, is it appropriate to, to, to think of it in terms of 3,300 less people at Rikers in that year? I, no. Yeah, it doesn't. So about, it's about nine beds per 100 people. A th one bed, not good at math, one See, bed you, per 100 you, people. So, you have so your the way people I to straighten you out too, like I do. Is, um, so about 3,000 uh, entries, slots, would translate to a little under 300 beds. Okay. So it's a big number of folks coming through. And that's but 300 beds on a daily basis. Correct. Got a it. reduction in average daily population. Got it. Um, so we have expanded since the original investment. Um, we now serve about 4,400 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, uh, people a year. Um, we anticipate some additional uh, investments both in Brooklyn and in Manhattan. Both of those DAs, as you know, have uh, made uh, changes in the way in which their own offices operate, and we've already seen a bit of an increase in Brooklyn, not so much in, in Manhattan. So, so how, many, how, how, how much extra money is in this year's budget? So I think um, uh, if I, it, I may have this slightly wrong. Um, oh, but they're, I they're think waiting. It's they're, about, ready to, they're ready to pounce. It's Don't about 1.6, 1.6 million. 1.6 million. million. And um, that will be how many more slots so that, divided by 100? How many more? How many? So that will um, cover about 450 additional folks in Brooklyn and about uh, 150 additional people slots in Manhattan. So that's about 600 more slots, which is about six more beds. 60. 60, thank yeah. you. Yep. All right. That doesn't seem very ambitious. Is there a reason? Is it, are you bumping up against like certain policy concerns? about who is eligible no. or? So, um, so right now we have eligibility criteria um, that I think you're aware of. Um, and uh, we don't find full usage of the eligibility criteria. So of the total number of people who are eligible, maybe 25% actually end up in the program. Now, why is that? Um, 
there are a couple of reasons. One could be that on paper they're eligible, but for whatever reason the judge um, doesn't agree. There may be things that we don't see. Um, the second, though, which is, I think, more significant uh, and is the thing that we need to uh, address front and center if we want supervised release to expand uh, is simply what the culture and practice is of prosecutors and judges. Uh, and even in places like Brooklyn and Manhattan where the DA has said I want to um, I want my assistants to not ask for bail and low you know in low bail cases um, we've seen Manhattan relatively flat and we've seen some increase in Brooklyn so it is variable and that's why when we put out smaller safer fairer we said in order to expand further, we need a seismic change in culture. People have to be willing to use it, both up to the criteria that we have, and if we want to go further, then there has to be a significant change in the way in which people think about uh, who's eligible to be out and who should be in. Um, it, your observation, um, right, in some places, Maybe the judges aren't so enthusiastic about it. Maybe the prosecutors aren't, the DAs aren't so enthusiastic about I, it. I don't think that's it. Oh, um, so we've seen you. actually quite good uptake, and we um, publish a supervised release scorecard every month. Mm -hmm. So you can see exactly what it is. Actually, in Queens, uh, quite high uptake, especially among felonies, which is interesting, you know. Um, so, so what do you mean by culture? I, I, mis I misunderstood. I, mis I don't want to mischaracterize. What do you mean by culture. I thought you meant a reluctance to recommend or accept. So there is some disjunction between having only 25% of the eligible folks screened and in the program um, and the other 80% that could be in. Like, what's going on there? And it's not for lack of slots being available. Right now we've served every single person. We have not turned away anyone. So, and then, uh, so we have some work to do just on our current eligibility requirement, eligibility filling that. And then the question is whether, you know, as you've suggested, that we go further. So right now, um, I think the council is funding a pilot project in Brooklyn um, to kind of expand the eligibility, requ eligibility guidelines of supervised release. We'll see how that goes. And the defense counsel play a role as well. I mean, defense counsel play the crucial role. Right. They are the gatekeepers. They're the ones who make the recommendation, right. and they're the ones who see the information. Are you seeing that they are uh, as, as informed as they should be about that opportunity, and and are as aggressive as they should be about trying yeah. to get that for their clients? I I think that they, you know, this is a a good program for them and for their clients. Yeah, that's an our only, our only problem with the program is there's not more of it. You know, my only, in this dialogue, well, People my have to use it. No, no, well, I'm, I hear you. Um, just, we're gonna have a raise the age hearing in April, but if you could maybe give us just a top line preview, our understanding or at least I, it's, I believe the administration said somewhere it's going to cost $200 million to implement Raise the Age. Have, have you thought about it? Do you, do you have a, a position on, on what is it going to cost the city to implement Raise the Age once it kicks in in October? And have we budgeted for any of that? So we have $300 million um, that, were, that is already in the budget for Horizon, Crossroads, and for facility upgrades. Um, and as part of the executive budget process right now, we're working with multiple agencies as to what their budget needs are going to be. And there are going to be budget needs because Corp Council is the prosecutor there's going to be an expanded role for probation that has a significant role to play in adjustment. The police department 
will need to do various things because they're obviously they deal with juveniles in a different way than adults. Um, so that's right now part of the executive budget process. Okay, so so none of that is in the preliminary budget. We haven't we haven't seen it, but there's a process going on now that when the executive budget comes out, there's going to be a, some itemization of okay, this is what the various agencies in the city will will need to to spend to be able to meet their raise the age obligations and and here it is council in the uh, in the budget yeah we don't have that answer right now and i would also just caution that our answer is our best estimate based on how we think the system is going to flow and will no doubt be adjusted through the year that is it depends a lot on how decisions are made. Um, is the adjustment rate at probation going to be the same or different? Is the detention rate of family court judges going to be the same or different than, corp than, than criminal court? Are DAs going to keep the cases or kick them? So lots of different decision points along the way where we're working with the agencies now, including the courts, obviously, and the DAs, uh, and the defenders in order to understand even their best understanding of how they will operate in this uh, new structure. So certainly s some of it, if not a big piece of it, will have to, will depend on, on what practices are once it actually does, does roll out. But we're gonna pass a budget by June 30th, the fiscal year starts July 1, raise the age kicks in in October. I assume there needs to be some initial Correct. budget, right? And you, you anticipate that'll be in the executive budget? Correct. Okay. We were hopeful to not have an executive budget hearing in May, but I guess now we will. Um, unless you can come really fully prepared at our April raise the age hearing. Do we have a date for that, by the way? April 18th. <laughs> April 18th. April 18th. Good. Good. All right. Um, last one. It's near. And Do you have another one? Yeah, absolutely. Councilmember Rose. Hi. I just have. Um, they always yell at me for asking a specific, like, Staten Island question. So I'm going to parse it a little differently. I haven't differently. been shameful about asking okay. Queen's questions. So you so, go ahead. So. Um, yeah, I see, you know, the funds, uh, the funding included uh, for cure violence expansion of four new catchment areas in the 48th, 57th, 52nd, 81st, and 88th precincts. Could you tell me how you determined, you know, um, that these should be the areas that sure. were? Eric, do you want to? So, yes, you have so to. Yes. If you're going to testify, you need to go to the table, yeah. you need to get sworn in. It's, it's a whole thing. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Just uh, state your name for the record. And Eric Cumberbatch. So the expansion was chosen based on uh, the top 20 precincts in the city, uh, dating back five years, that had the highest rates of shooting incidents. So we looked at 20 precincts total, who had the highest shooting incidents, and then we pulled out which precincts do not currently have CMS programming. The remaining precincts that don't have any CMS programming, we looked at what are things we can do in those areas. Uh, CMS being one of them, public safety coalitions being another piece, uh, adding things like mobile trauma units and other interventions that our office is currently working on. So the four, eight, five, two, eight, one, and eight, eight were decided that those were the precincts that we would launch CMS programming in. The remaining others, we looked at public safety coalitions and other pieces that, that we're, we're aiming to roll out. Now the 8-8 eight, eight precinct is unique in this in that uh, it's located in the Fort Greene section of Brooklyn. So if you looked at by precinct number of shooting incidents, that one wouldn't pop out in the top 20. Um, but what does pop out 
in very small areas within the 8-8, uh, in and around Ingersoll and Whitman houses, we see a high, very high concentration of shooting incidents there. Um, so that and also looking at a lot of granular qualitative um, information from PD led us to putting a, a, making a CMS catchment area in that particular uh, location. So um, is there any um, look, um, is there any way that the metric looks at um, increasing cure violence programs in an area that might already have one? For example, Staten Island has cure violence in the Stapleton Park Hill catchment area. Correct. But um, we have a high need in the Mariners Harbor Arlington area. Right. Um, how, what metric would you have to look at for that to be included in the funding decisions um, mm -hmm. to expand a program like that? So a few points. Um, the CMS provider, uh, True to Life, Central Family Life Center, uh, they have received state funding to expand into the Mariners Harbor area already. So they're actually replicating in the early stages of replicating programming uh, in that area as well. Um, the Mariners Harbor area falls outside of the 120. I believe it's the 121 precinct. Um, so that would have been a flag for us as we look at all precincts in terms of shooting incidents. We are aware of the spike in shootings in Mariners Harbor. Um, and what we've been doing is looking at what else do we do as residents and, and, and uh, business owners and organizations um, beyond cure violence, beyond crisis management system. So we've been building public safety coalitions. Uh, we funded a number of residents uh, to do Occupy the Block, Occupy the Corner uh, through our public safety, uh, uh, our small grant, Safe in the City grant opportunity. Um, and we've also been building with young people to be uh, the voice and leadership on the ground. So we have uh, a peer leadership committee at MockJ and many of um, our members reside in Mariners Harbor houses, West Brighton houses, Stapleton houses as well. So we're looking at what are all the holistic things that we can do, um, not just relying on cure violence as, or, or crisis management system as the only uh, vehicle, but really looking at how do we engage the entire community on behavioral change. So Mock J would not consider um, giving any funds to augment the state funding for um, that catchment area. I wouldn't say it, it, I wouldn't say it's Mock J wouldn't do it. I mm -hmm. think it's ha having access to additional funding, and I think the council can be very supportive if that's the direction we would like to to move in. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Right. Lastly, um, how would you assess the shift of um, uh, so many low-level, nonviolent quality of life offenses from the a criminal summons court to oath. Um, I don't know if you would have at your disposal the budget impact of, of that, and just how do you think that's going? So, um, I think it's going. I think it's going well. Um, I think the most significant thing has been um, a big, big drop in criminal summonses, um, some replacement with civil summonses, but by no means as many. Uh, and we actually have some of this up on our website on, in a summons uh, sheet, but we've seen, um, you know, a 92% reduction in open container, 92% uh, 93 percent reduction in parks offenses, et cetera, just very, very steep reductions um, and not, not uh, equalized by the increase in civil offenses. So that is very positive. I think the other thing that's very positive is I think we all had our eye on a concern about kind of the Fergusization of civilian, you know, civil, making civil summonses because there are fines and worked very hard to have 
a, um, a, a very sort of swift and brief uh, community service option that you can just do right there um, as I instead. And that's going along a little early to tell, you know, is that a great success? Is that not a great success? We have uh, the whole thing being evaluated. Um, we've seen a big reduction um, in warrants, which I think we all were looking for and was one of the things that drove this. Um, so again, a lot of that information, all the specifics is up on our website, happy to, to provide it to you otherwise. Um, but we think it's going quite well. Terrific. Thank you very much. Welcome. Um, next, we'll hear from the Office of Civil Justice. Get your people. Everyone could uh, grab a seat or clear out, as the case may be. We can proceed. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Me too. Are we ready to get started back there? Great. Ready back there? Yeah. Okay, good. Sir, team, ready? Thank you, Chair. Good. Let's uh, get sworn in and get going. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank yes. you very much. Good. Can we put uh, 10 minutes on the clock? Thank you. 10. No, 10, 10 for, for them. Yeah. Jordan's not even going to need the whole 10, he told me. If that. If that. Thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for inviting us to appear before the committee today. Uh, my name is Jordan Dressler. I'm the Civil Justice Coordinator uh, with HRA's Office of Civil Justice. I'm joined today by the Department of Social Services Executive Deputy Commissioner for Finance, Aaron Villari, the Office of Civil Justice's Executive Director, Jacqueline Moore. Uh, my full testimony is in the record. I'm just going to touch on the high points here today. Um, Providing civil legal services for New Yorkers in need, particularly for tenants, is a critical element of our pr uh, homelessness prevention efforts, as well as our efforts to combat income inequality, address homelessness, and uh, address poverty. Uh, by investing in these important services, we're already seeing results. Between 2014 and 2017, over 180,000 New Yorkers received legal assistance through the city's legal services programs for tenants facing eviction, harassment, and displacement. 
and at the same time, residential evictions by marshals have declined by 27%. As you know, in partnership with the council, we're implementing the nation's first universal access to council program. This represents an unprecedented investment in legal services to help New Yorkers stay in their homes. This initiative is just one of the many programs I'm going to be touching on today and uh, as well as walking through some key points laid out in our 2017 annual report and strategic plan. Uh, the report describes growth in civil legal services funding and programs in New York City, as well as strategies with regard to key areas of civil legal need, specifically low-wage workers facing legal issues including wage theft, discrimination, and other challenges, and low and moderate income New Yorkers who face legal jeopardy due to delinquent debt. As for the budget, in fiscal year 2019, the administration will be committing $124 million towards civil legal justice programs at OCJ. By comparison, in fiscal year 2013, total governmental funding, that's city, state, and federal funding for civil legal services in New York City was less than half that amount, at 60.4 million. The preliminary budget plan for fiscal 19 includes baseline funding at OCJ as follows. 93 million for legal services programs for tenants facing eviction, harassment, and displacement, which includes 56.6 million for eviction defense legal services for low-income tenants in housing court, including further implementation of universal access, as well as 36.4 million for anti-harassment and displacement legal services, as well as administrative and staff support. And 30.5 million for legal assistance programs for immigrant New Yorkers which includes 5.9 million for legal assistance programs, including the Immigrant Opportunities Initiative, or IOI, and 2.1 million in immigration legal programs funded by community service block grants, as well as 8.7 for legal and navigation services and outreach through the Action NYC program operated in partnership with MOYA, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, and the City University of New York. In addition to the administration's commitment, I want to acknowledge uh, the ongoing commitment of the City Council to expanding access to justice. In fiscal year 18, HRA is overseeing $24.2 million in discretionary funding added by the City Council for legal services for the working poor, immigration legal defense services for detained individuals, unaccompanied minors and families with children facing deportation, assistance for survivors of domestic violence and veterans, and general support for civil legal services providers. The city's financial and administrative commitment to these important services has perhaps never been more crucial to serving and assisting low-income New Yorkers. With funding for civil legal services in the state's budget for the judiciary flat this year, and with the Trump administration's proposed budget threatening to defund the main vehicle for federal funding for civil legal services in the United States, the Legal Services Corporation, and eliminate entirely the CSBG grants used for civil legal services programs here in New York City, our city's commitment has never been more important. The loss of these funding streams nationwide and in New York City would be felt acutely by low-income litigants, and we continue to monitor the situation and remain in close dialogue with our provider partners as we gauge the impact of any cuts to non-city civil legal services funding here in New York. Let me turn to legal services for tenants. The centerpiece of our tenant legal services initiatives is universal access to counsel. With Mayor de Blasio's signing of Council Intro 214B into law in August of last year, New York City has become the first and only city in the United States that will provide access to legal services to every tenant facing eviction in court. Local Law 136 of 2017 establishes programs that will uh, provide access to eviction defense legal services for all tenants in housing court and in New York City Housing Authority administrative termination of tenancy proceedings. Implementation of the first phase of universal access is already underway. Low-income tenants facing eviction proceedings in housing court in 15 zip codes across the city, identified based on factors including high numbers of shelter entries, the prevalence of rent-regulated housing, and the volume of eviction proceedings, among other factors, have access to free, full legal representation, a defense lawyer on their eviction case from the beginning until the end of the case. Universal access provides for free legal representation in court to New Yorkers with household incomes below 200% of the federal poverty level, which is roughly $50,000 for a family of four. And we will be establishing a program to provide access to brief legal assistance, a legal counseling session to advise a tenant facing eviction about the law, possible defenses, and next steps to take to those households earning more. At full implementation in fiscal 22, we estimate that 125,000 cases affecting 400,000 New Yorkers will be served under the program annually. 
to launch the Universal Access Program. OCG, OCJ increased funding to nonprofit legal providers already providing anti-eviction legal services in housing court through our HPLP program, Homelessness Prevention Law Project. Uh, we're in the very early phases of implementation, but we've already seen successes. Last year, as part of the implementation process, we, along with the legal services provider organizations with whom we work, and the housing court collaborated to develop robust and reliable processes for tenants in zip codes targeted for universal access to be connected with available counsel. This effort built on the expanded legal services program, which we established in fiscal 16, as a precursor and pilot for universal access. In Brooklyn, the Bronx, Manhattan, and Queens, OCJ collaborated with supervising judges, resolution part judges in the housing court, and non-judicial staff, as well as the providers, and developed intake processes to connect tenants in need of services with lawyers to provide those services. The court started routing newly calendared cases drawn from those zip codes to their own designated courtrooms. Legal service providers have established intake operations in or next to these designated courtrooms, allowing eligible tenants to access their services in an efficient and effective process. Our investments, coupled with the refinements we've made to case referral and intake processes implemented in partnership with the housing court and the providers, are already yielding meaningful results and housing court is becoming a significantly fairer place for tenants who now have wider access to legal assistance. Based on an analysis of data provided by the Office of Court Administration, we are seeing substantially higher rates of legal representation in areas targeted for assistance. In the 10 zip codes across the city that were initially selected for targeted legal resources, the legal representation rate for tenants in those zip codes who are facing eviction in housing court has dramatically increased. In the beginning of fiscal 16, roughly 16% 16 of tenants in these ZIFs facing eviction had counsel in housing court. Two years later, in the beginning of fiscal 18, the rate of representation for tenants in these zip codes tripled, with 48% of tenants in court having counsel. These increases were seen in the four boroughs where we implemented these intake processes. And naturally, in December of last year, we established the same process in Staten Island establishing the uni universal access uh, program in every borough and on track for further implementation. As access to services has increased, evictions across the city have decreased. As I mentioned, in 2017, residential evictions by city marshals declined year over year 5% compared to 2016 and are down 27% since 2013, a period during which New York City substantially increased funding for legal services for low-income tenants. Over that four-year period of 2014 through 17, an estimated 70,000 New Yorkers remained in their homes as a result of these decreased evictions. We are also seeing that increases in housing legal services are having an impact in the courts. In housing court, the number of, evic of eviction case files filed continues to fall, with approximately 17,000 fewer eviction proceedings filed in 2017 than in 2013, a decline of 7%. At the same time, court statistics provided by the housing court reflect increased substantive litigation. The number of pretrial motions in 2016 was 19% higher than in 2014, while emergency orders to show cause, requests by tenants for eviction cases to be returned to the court calendar after a judgment of eviction to seek more time to pay outstanding rent or to raise new legal arguments that were newly identified, declined 16% over the same period. This year, we're also working with legal service providers to develop a program model to effectively provide comprehensive access to legal services for NYCHA tenants facing termination of tenancy proceedings. Following the recent proposal by Chief Judge DeFiori's Special Commission on the Future of Housing Court that Staten Island serve as a bellwether for universal access implementation, this is expected to be, uh, begin in the spring. A pilot program focusing on NYCHA tenants in Staten Island facing termination te tenancy proceedings is expected to provide such tenants with access to legal services and subsequently serve as a model for expansion across the city. Is that my time? Yeah, another minute, another minute just to touch on uh, immigration legal services, another big area of focus for us. Um, thank you. Uh, in fiscal 18, administration increased its baseline funding commitment for immigration legal services, related legal services programs to 30.5 million. 
with the council's investment in legal services programs for immigrants facing removal and other legal needs, the city's total investment in legal assistance programs for immigrants stands at over 47 million in fiscal 18. That's a dramatic increase from 7 million compared to four, fiscal 2013. I'll leave it at that and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, Council Member Rose, do you wanna go first? Because you, you, you're here and you're waiting and <laughs> just wanna, I don't want, I don't want you to get punished for sticking around. Thank you, thank you. Um, um, under the expanded universal access to NYCHA administrative proceedings, in 2017, uh, your office outlined a pilot program for NYCHA set to launch in Staten Island. Um, why were these services being, why are these services being piloted in Staten Island? And what is the estimated number of NYCHA tenants that will be served in Staten Island? The fir Thank you, Council Member. The, the first question is a very good one, and we are in some ways taking our lead from uh, Chief Judge DeFiori, who both for the Special Commission and in her own state of our judiciary, identified Richmond County as a place where we can truly reach universal access faster and most efficiently. Part of that is due to size, Part of that is due to proximity. Um, and part of that is due to uh, the uh, momentum that we've already found moving very quickly after we had sort of proven out a service model in housing court in the four large boroughs. We truly hit the ground running in uh, Staten Island Housing Court. And we have been welcomed with open arms, both by the uh, court administration and the presiding judges. In and terms the plan of is to extend this program um, throughout, expand it throughout New York City? Well, the plan is certainly to, to expand mm -hmm. throughout New York City. And we have our statutory obligation and our designs to do so before, uh, by fiscal 22. We're mm -hmm. starting with uh, Staten Island uh, with respect to NYCHA administrative proceedings and mm -hmm. expect over the course of this coming year to be implementing that uh, and doing so in a way that we expect to scale. We want to see what works and what doesn't uh, and Staten Island is a very good place to start with. And of course I'm not complaining. <laughs> I, I really appreciate that we're going to be first in something uh, this time. I'm, I'm sorry that we need it but it's, you know, that it's, uh, it's welcome. And so intro 214A, um, which is universal access, um, you know, Staten Island has a very small percentage of regulated housing stock. So um, how is this going to impact the allocation of funds in the budget for at-risk tenants uh, on Staten Island? With respect to matters pending in housing court, um, I think it's important to flag here that uh, there is no determination of merit happening at the point of uh, planning or implementation. Uh, this is not a program where providers are obliged to triage cases uh, one way or another. We are really aspiring to universal access, and that means having a case, a lawyer so on the case. Any housing uh, any, dispute, any, regardless any, of whether it's rent regulated, Section 8 or whatever. That, that's right. Okay. That's right. Okay. And, and just to, to follow up on that point, uh, we have already seen and we expect to continue to see um, zealous advocacy and creativity on the part of our nonprofit legal provider partners in finding the right ways to mount defenses, even in cases where the whole panoply of rules and regulations that relate to rent regulation aren't at play with respect to that eviction case. Uh, there's a law out there that just dictates you know, what happens in housing court no matter what the nature of the housing is. And we're very pleased to see that the providers with whom we work are extremely creative and extremely zealous in figuring out the ways to defend their clients to the fullest. Thank you. Um, fiscal year 2018 adopted budget. An agreement was reached between the city council and the administration that would carry over the five million anti-eviction legal services initiative from the council over to HRA as part of the administration's expansion of right to counsel, right, universal counsel. Are all the groups that were previously funded under the council's anti-eviction legal services initiative now funded and contracted through HRA? Yes. They are. 
And um, is it the council's understanding that HRA would be amending the fiscal 2018 contracts to 13 groups that were previously funded through the council? And what is the status of these contracts? Have they been executed? And is this funding available to legal service providers um, who, are, who begin providing services? Through a combination of direct contracts and uh, existing subcontracts, we were able to uh, work out the contracting vehicles to maintain the continuity of funding for those providers. So uh, there's no interruption in services? Nope. No, it, mm -hmm. it, took some, it took some doing, and I think we worked very collaboratively with uh, all of our providers to make that happen. Um, it's our intent, and so uh, the contracts themselves are in the, the pre-registration process, but the terms have been agreed upon and they're just in, in process. And it included all of the previous funded uh, contracts, the other 13? The providers. Right, correct. the providers. Okay. I, I, just to be clear, I, what I, can, about, I, I can't um, speak to the actual number of them because I don't have a <coughs> list in front of me, but I'll defer to the council member. What about the Goddard um, Riverside Community Center, which is not really a legal service provider? respectfully disagree. They provide a lot of very valuable anti-eviction and anti-harassment legal services, and they are doing so through our contracts. Uh, they are a subcontractor with the Urban Justice Center, which holds one of our anti-harassment and tenant protection programs, and we were able to uh, work that out with uh, all parties uh, to maintain continuity of their services. Okay. And is it... Um and how will the administration address the fiscal 2019 contracts? Will the same groups be funded, at including this point, Goddard? We do expect continuity through fiscal 19. Okay, and I just have one other question. I'm, I'm sorry, I'll be really quick. Um, you know, uh, in addition to IOI, OCJ um, oversees immigration legal service programs funded through 2.1 million in federal community service block grants which is administered in partnership with the Department of Youth and Community Development. Um, and as we know, the Trump administration has proposed to eliminate this source of funding. What is the contingency plan? It's premature to be making concrete plans to backfill funding that currently exists. I would point out that in the president's skinny budget a year ago, the CSBG grant, which numbers in the billions nationwide, of which the 2.1 for these particular services is a small part, and even a small part within the city, DYCD is making use of CSBG funding for a variety of important social services programs. Uh, it was similarly proposed to be zeroed out and was not. So we are not terribly pessimistic at this point, but we are monitoring it very closely and assuming uh, God forbid if that were to happen, uh, we would work closely with our providers to see what needed to be done. Okay, work closely with your providers to what? How what? are they gonna, uh, are you, so are you gonna make some kind of plan, some kind of contingent plan we'll based ha on? We'll have, to, we'll have to see what the situation uh, is developing into and, and will, make whatever plan. Will it be too late um, to do that once if you find out that the funds are not coming, um, shouldn't we have a backup plan already in place? It's hard to, to drill down into a design backup plan without knowing what, if any, funds are actually going to uh, uh, be eliminated. Um, but you do know what it costs now, right? To right. deliver those services. So wouldn't the backup plan include just including that amount of money in the budget from another budget line, another source? I'm not so sure it's that simple, but I, I would have to defer to the, you know, my finance folks and, and uh, as well as OMB. Um, obviously, uh, there are a number of uh, broad and very narrow threats to the city's budget, and there are a number of contingency plans being made uh, at a very high level um, about what those threats would look like. Um, this is a small but important part, and so we would be part of a larger um, effort to... Uh, to I just want to make sure that it's a part of the voices that are raised to make sure that in the outcome of no funding, that there 
that they do not experience a, a complete cut. Thank you. Understood. Thank you. Um, your testimony in the, in the report, and, and we met the other day, uh, covered a lot of the ground that I'm interested in. So I won't belabor those points. I do, however, want to drill down on this issue of the 170 crimes carve out. When the council created its uh, passed, passed a <clears throat> bill signed into law limiting the city's cooperation with ICE and through the process of negotiations, these 170 offenses were, 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 were carved out of that. Um, it had not been our expectation that that carve out or that concession, if you will, would, would then travel into other spheres of, of city operations and, and, and government. But as you know, there was um, a dispute as to the extent to which the, the city, the mayor would accept additional legal services funding presenting to protect people from deportation who fit under these uh, 170. So could you give us, an, uh, an, um, can you explain for us where in the contracts that you have anything to do with, there is any provision relating to or limiting the services or requiring screening based on these 170 offenses? It relates to immigration-related legal services so, and the contracts that pertain to those. So it's not merely immigration legal services focused on preventing removal or representing someone in deportation proceedings? Immigration-related legal services. So if uh, you use a legal uh, services contract and, and somebody is showing up at a neighborhood office of XYZ legal services provider, to get advice on how to apply for DACA or how to, uh, what are their rights if they're interacting with the police, the contract that you are putting out with that, with that provider would, would prevent that provider from providing that, that advice? Well, I don't know about prevent. Um, that would be up to the provider. Um, but with respect to the contracts, it relates to immigration-related legal so, so the contract would not allow any of its contracting funds to be used to, to represent that um, that immigrant um, in 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 any kind of legal matter whatsoever, immigration related legal services, mm -hmm. and and so if somebody came and, and said, uh, uh, I want to know if I'm eligible for DACA, or I want to know what the, what it what it means, what my legal status is based on Trump's you know latest tweet or twist or turns. Would, would, would that be a kind of legal service, that rendering of advice? It would depend on which contract, but with respect to the IOI contracts that we administer, yes, I believe the answer would be yes. Mm -hmm. and, and how, are you, are you providing any additional funding to assist these providers with, with doing the screenings, screening necessary so that they don't run afoul of this provision? The providers are, uh, in, in the community um, are, uh, have, have very good relationships with all manners of funders, state funding, uh, philanthropic funding. And so uh, up until now, certainly with respect to NIFA, uh, the providers have made use of relationships with their philanthropic, philanthropic partners. So, so the answer is no. The, the city's answer. not providing any funding for, this, for these screenings. That's correct. And, and with respect to the with respect to the IOI contracts that we administer. Right. And um, for funders like, I think we might hear from, say, Verizon later, that are providing a, a wide range of services to, to immigrants, the, the contracts that include this 170 crime prohibition, um, are, are, is it narrowly tailored to just the the legal services aspect of, of, of their of their contracts, or does it cover all the services that they provide? It it's our intention for it to be tailored in the way that you've described. If that's proven not to be the case, and we hear that it's not the case, then we will pick it up with our provider partners as we always do. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many contracts have gone out approximately that have, have included these 
provisions? I don't have that number. Have you gotten any complaints from any providers or any questions from any providers? How come this 170 is applying to me? We have. And who were those? I couldn't tell you specifically who at this time. What, what kind of provider? Like what kinds of questions did they have? Implementation questions. Uh, how to interpret this or that with respect to that language. Uh, some large offices, some smaller offices, and we've done our best to answer every single one. Do you, do you, does the language that you're putting in these contracts make any distinction between legal representation and, and legal advice? Someone comes in the office and they want some advice, that's advice. That doesn't mean that that legal services provider is now representing them in any kind of proceeding or matter. That's true. In our IOI contracts, uh, both advice, consultation, assistance, and representation are referred to as legal services. They are legal services. What's the justification for, for that, since this is the administration's policy for someone showing up at a legal services provider's office and saying, I don't know my, my eligibility for this or that? You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer to the testimony that was taken last week and with an understanding there's going to be additional testimony next week at the immigration hearing. I'm here to talk about implementation. You, you're, you can't speak to what the rationale is behind the contracts that your office is putting out and overseeing? I think the question's been posed as to the rationale behind the policy, and I know that there's disagreement about that between members of the council, members of the administration. Um, I have no additional light to shed on that. Okay. Well, because I, I, I know that there was disagreement, and we know what the base of that disagreement is when it comes to should the city be spending resources to represent people in, in removal proceedings if they've been uh, already adjudicated on, on this long list of crimes. I'm not sure that I've heard anyone from the administration say why that should extend to simply the giving of legal advice in circumstances that have nothing to do with whether or not that person is getting removed or not. I mean, whether or not you could have someone who's a crime victim walk into a legal services provider's office and say, listen, if I report this crime to the, to the police, this thing that happened to me, what, 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 how, what am I exposing myself to? I don't think anyone, I've heard the city articulate a rationale for why that person should not get the benefit of, of, of legal advice. Do you have anything to offer on that? No, as I said, I'm here to talk about the implementation of the policy. Well, have you had any uh, providers come and say, we'd like to give this person advice and, and if that, or if that person, such a person shows up, are we, are we gonna run afoul of the contract? We haven't had any specific cases brought to our attention. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. John Furlong, Coalition Against Illegal Hotels. Murray Cox, Inside Airbnb, Coalition Against Illegal Hotels. Are you both, both testifying or just one of you is testifying for the coalition? We, we, we'd like to have one person testifying for the organization. Testify for the other organization. Okay. Michael Pollenberg, Safe Horizon. Charles Nunez, Youth Represent. I'll come get it. I'll come get it. Uh, you're all going to be at the panel, so if you're testifying, <laughs> get on up there. Grab a chair, get on up there. Raise your right hand, we get sworn in. 
to swear a firm testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Yes. Good. Um, we'll just go from left to right, three minutes on the clock. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you to the members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Jonathan Furlong. I'm the Director of Organizing and Housing Conservation Coordinators, and I'm here to give testimony on behalf of the Coalition Against Illegal Hotels, and would like to take this opportunity to provide some input on the budget for the Mayor's Office of Special Enforcement, OSE, which falls under the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. The coalition is comprised of organizations, uh, the Coalition Against Legal Hotels, rather, is comprised of orgs uh, spanning New York City whose, worst, whose work lies in some of the neighborhoods most negatively impacted by commercial uh, uh, illegal commercial hotel use. The Goddard Riverside Law Project on Manhattan's West Side, Housing Conservation Coordinators, HCC, uh, and the West Side Neighborhood Alliance based in Hell's Kitchen, serving the West Side, the Cooper Square Committee in the Lower East Side, St. Nick's Alliance in Wh Greenpoint, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, MFY Legal Services, uh, uh, organizing citywide. Uh, it should also be noted that uh, 40 other neighborhood-based or organizations have endorsed the work and the efforts of the coalition. Tenant organizing and community mobilization is a crucial part of the fight against illegal hotels in neighborhoods all over the city, and the work of OSC has been critical uh, um, as in a partner uh, of that fight, as a partner, rather, of that fight. The coalition sees OSC as an integral partner in protecting and preserving affordable housing across the city. The coalition would like to urge continued and hopefully increased funding of OSC to ensure that their efforts are maintained, specifically around inspections and enforcement, use of data, legal cases, uh, and engagement. The coalition would like to ur also urge the council to ensure that the budget allow for increased enforcement on behalf of OSA of all city and state laws against all that violate them to protect our precious housing uh, and, and communities. Perhaps the most important one being the state's multiple dwelling law, which bans entire apartment vacation rentals in most, in most buildings. This law is really being ignored by many residents across the city uh, and commercial operators that have multiple listings in a single building. While the coalition has tremendously appreciated OSC's focus on the so-called worst of the worst actors, or work, um, for our work to be successful, the agency must be funded and staffed appropriately to address all illegal activity, uh, illegal hotel activity, rather, no, no matter how big or small. Finally, the, whoops, the coalition requests uh, that allowances be made in the budget that would allow uh, the agency to increase its visibility in the community and help educate and mobilize community groups which are fighting uh, this issue in their neighborhoods. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, to my knowledge, there's no cut to OSE in the budget. So, okay. Good, okay. Yep. If you knew something we didn't, we'd want to know. Yeah, know. Got it. Go ahead, sir. Um, good afternoon, council members, city officials. Um, my name is Murray Cox, and I'm here today to provide input on the Mayor's Office of Special Enforcement as well. I'll try not to overlap. Um, uh, so in the area of illegal hotel enforcement, um, uh, a recent report uh, from the University of McGill found that up to 13,500 housing units have been removed from New York City's long-term housing market, the majority uh, illegally, with the complicity of belligerent platforms like Airbnb. Um, I'm the founder of a project called Inside Airbnb, which provides data on the phenomenon around the world, including working with elected and city officials in places like Paris, Amsterdam, London, Venice, San Francisco, and here in New York City. Um, I'm also a member of the Coalition Against Illegal Hotels. Um, so I have some specific concerns just on the transparency and accountability mm -hmm. of the budget for the Mayor's Office of Special en Enforcement. Um, to maintain current um, activities. I don't think we have much visibility and transparency into that budget, so I just wanted to address that point. Um, and then um, I also make a call for um, uh, increase in budget to allow increased enforcement of all city and state laws against all that violate them. Um, for example, the major state law, which, is, um, which bans entire apartment vacation rentals in most apartment buildings, being, it's being ignored by tens of thousands of residents, um, not the least commercial operators. And in boroughs, particularly Brooklyn and Queens, one and two family homes are being converted arbitrarily into tourist accommodation. Um, and then also that allowances be made in the budget to fund community organizers to help and educate and, um, and mobilize community groups. Uh, uh, which are fighting this issue in their neighborhoods. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Michael Pollenberg, I'm Vice President of Government Affairs for Safe Horizon, uh, the nation's leading victim assistance organization and New York's largest provider of services to victims of crime. We're going to talk very briefly about three initiatives that are funded by the Council that we contract through MOCJ, 
Uh, the first is the Child Advocacy Center Initiative. Um, this is an initiative the council has funded for many years. Uh, you'll see in the testimony that I prepared that there's been a rather large increase in cases that we've seen. It's been a 115% increase in volume over the last five years, in part because when there's high profile child fatalities, more and more cases are referred to us that probably should have been referred to us all along, but for whatever reason they thought perhaps they weren't, uh, didn't rise to the level of a child advocacy center referral. Um, so we're grateful that these cases are coming to us. We, we want to, it's why we're there, is to provide services and a response to victims of child abuse. Uh, and we're asking that the council restore the funding uh, uh, through the sexual assault initiative of 748,000 to the child advocacy centers. And we're delighted that we understand you're gonna be visiting the Queen CAC uh, later this month. So we look forward to that visit. Um, the Dove initiative has been around since 2006. Safe Horizon is the program administrator of that contract. Um, we now have 80, over 80 grantees selected by the council, by all 51 members. Um, we're on the cusp of providing some great, there's gonna be the year two of training on evaluation for grantees, and we're looking forward to that. Um, the initiative is at its highest level, at $7.8 million uh, for FY18, and we're hoping that that funding level can continue for all the grantees for FY19. And the final piece, which I think uh, is probably what you're most interested in, uh, is that we get funding through the Initiative for Immigrant Survivors of Domestic Violence or through the YWI Initiative for our Immigration Law Project. Uh, we do also get IOI funding. Um, uh, uh, that's through, HR, through HRA. Um, so uh, this funding, all of the funding, the, the YWI funding, the IOI funding, helps us do core services, immigration relief, for victims of crime, whether they're fleeing violence uh, abroad or were victimized here in New York. And we're hopeful that for the YWI, the uh, funding in FY18 is $75,000. We're hopeful that that can be restored in FY19. I don't know if you had any specific questions about the well, other, I, other I, issue. I do want to ask you about the... I, after you're done, I want to ask you about these. Okay. The 170. Yeah. So, Well, good afternoon, Chairman, um, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to testify, and thank you to the Justice, um, to the Justice Systems Committee as well. Uh, my name is Charles Nunez, and I'm the Community Advocate at Youth Represent. Um, for my testimony today, I will focus on the implementation of Raise the Age. In my written testimony, I, um, I focus on several Raise the Age um, aspects um, and critical elements of them. So the first element that I focus on in my written testimony is the supervision of specialized secure detention. Second one is monitoring of outcomes for youth under the Raise the Age legislation. And the third one is the allocation of funds for necessary legal services. Um, but in the interest of time, I'll focus on the supervision for 16 to 17 year olds um, in specialized secure detention facilities. Uh, when Raise the Age, when we're advocating for Raise the Age, um, there was a consensus that New York must treat 16 and 17 year olds um, humanely and put them in a justice system that will hold them accountable, but at the same time nurture their youth development and focus on rehabilitation. Um, we know now that the obligation of like remo removing the 16 and 17 year olds um, from Rikers Island by October 2018 is quite the burden, but it is also not impossible. Um, and the city's current plan to transfer the correctional officers from Rikers Island, along with those 16 and 17 year olds being held in Rikers Island, is completely contrary to the, um, to the principles and what was initially the purpose of New York State raising um, the age of criminal responsibility for 16 and 17 year olds. Um, and on multiple occasion, it has been proven that the Department of Corrections officers is not equipped to manage 16 and 17 year old youth. Um, in 2014, the United States Department of Justice released an investigation um, report on Rikers Island concluding, concluding um, that the New York City Department of Corrections systematically has failed to protect adolescent inmates from harm. This harm is the result of the repeated use of excessive and unnecessary force by correction officers against adolescent inmates. And these inmates are 16, 17, and 18 year old detainees. Um, and more recently, in 2017, the Nunez Independent Monitor um, report stated that serious and problematic issues involving staff use of force continue in unabated fashion. This ingrained propensity to staff to immediately default to force to manage and 
To manage any level of inmate threat or resistance continues to produce high monthly incident numbers. The cultural dynamic that permeates so many encounters between staff and inmates in DOC is quite simply a, a consequence of staff actions and behaviors that too often engender, nurture, and encourage confrontation. Um, so just like from, a, from noticing all these different reports that provide explicit um, evidence showing that there's force being used by correctional officers on 16 and 17 year olds, we know that this is not the way to have, to have 16 and 17 year olds supervised by the same Department of Correction correctional officers. And quite honestly, when there's a will, there's a way. And right now, we just feel that the city is showing a lack of will to represent and protect our, our most vulnerable children. Well, thank you. And I agree with you. And, and I and a number of other council members wrote to the city um, demanding that the- Totally aware yeah, of the, sending a uh, letter to like the mayor. Yeah, and yeah. And, and the, we did get a response today or yesterday, um, which wasn't very satisfactory. So it's something that we're still going to be be pushing. No disrespect okay. to the correction officers at Rikers Island, yeah. who have really, I think, the hardest job of and of any worker in, in the city. Um, but we want to get young people out of that whole corrections, adult corrections um, environment. Perfect. And thank you for your support on that, Councilmember. Good. Um, so if I can ask the safe rising. So okay. can you tell us your experience with um, with the 170 and, and whether it uh, consistent with, with what Mr. Dressler testified? Yeah, so thank you uh, for the question. Um, you know, we're abiding by the terms of the contract. I mean, the vast majority of the, the overwhelming majority of the clients that we see don't have uh, uh, these disqualifying crimes. It's true that the vast, a lot of people that we serve have some criminal justice involvement based on the fact that there tend to be people of color in New York City who draw a lot of police attention. Um, they, uh, but, but you know, the issue of those particular offenses interfering with our ability to do the work, again, we, as a victim services organization, aren't seeing that many folks walking in the door with convictions on those offenses. That being said, um, we ultimately would like to be the ones to decide whether or not we're going to move forward on a case based on whether or not we think we can win. Um, can we get this person immigration relief? There may be cases where somebody comes in with a, you know, a, 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 a record a mile long, and we're thinking that you know there's not an immigration judge in the country that's going to give this person asylum or give this person whatever relief it is that they're asking for, um, and that's a determination that we're going to make uh, in consultation with a client based on our experience as an immigration legal services provider. Um, that's a little bit different than the city saying, by the way, for, for crimes A, B, C, D, and E, and, and, and so on and so forth, you can't represent them, you can't give uh, advice or consults. And we do work, you know, we have as a victim services organization, uh, you know, there's this, this myth that there's victims over here and offenders over here, uh, and they're two completely different groups of people. We know that's not true. We know there are a lot of offenders who've been victims of crime at some point in their lives. We know that there's a lot of our victims that have co uh, uh, committed offenses or, or, or broken the law in some capacity over the years. Uh, we still serve them. We still help folks get shelter. We still help uh, people call our hotline. Uh, we see folks all, all throughout our organization. So this piece that there's certain crimes that you just can't uh, uh, meet with somebody or, or represent them feels different than than you know what we what our normal experience is. I think the council feels the same way. But you'll keep us posted and Absolutely. alert. We you know very concerned about the creeping nature of this uh, this concept that people who um, you know are on the other side of these 170 offenses now for the rest of their life can't get legal representation in, in an immigration matter of, of any kind whatsoever and you know well why not extend that to uh, as, as objectionable as that is but then you know it's going to extend into other areas so you will you will keep us posted absolutely all right thank you all Thanks, very much you. our last uh, visitor is our uh, our old friend mr komatsu Two minutes. 
Oh, wow. Such a long time. Um, well, if you add up all the times that you testify, um, actually, it's, it's th quite, quite a rebuttal time. I'm sorry, but there's something called the First Amendment, and you actually impeded my ability to testify last time we met. Right. Um, Do you so raise your right hand, sir? Be sworn in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do, unlike Jordan Dressler. Um, Two minutes. Okay, so Jordan Dressler was uh, at this table a short time ago. He actually lied to you. Um, he claimed that lawyers can provide uh, legal assistance without evaluating the merits as to whether to provide such assistance. Um, Stephen Banks made something, made a comment uh, totally contradic that contradicts that on December 16th of 2016 at the law school. New York Law School, that is. Um, as you may recall, I previously informed you that HRA is doing business with a company that stole my pay, that still hasn't paid me. So you're taking all this, all these remarks from HRA's representatives at, at face value when you're not actually vetting them to see, is it actually factual? And you have people like me sitting in this chair making truthful remarks to you with no recourse, no relief. Um, I talked to Stephen Banks on December 14th of last year. He told me that he would not refer me to another legal services uh, partner. I got rejected by um, all the legal services organizations to which I was referred by HRA. In your, the report I gave you, it confirms that, uh, yeah, they never made a de decision based on merit when rejecting um, my request for such a legal assistance. Uh, Mr. Dresser was also part of the Special Commission on the Housing Court that was established by Judge DeFiore. The same judge, Clifton Emhart, uh, was on that same commission who uh, illegally evicted me from my apartment in Jackson Heights. He's now going to be the assigned judge uh, presiding over a case on April 10th um, involving a 66-year-old lady who used to live in my old apartment building in Rigo Park. And I have a sworn affidavit from that slumlord confirming they neglected making repairs in an elevator in that building. So before I began to be illegally excluded from public meetings that the mayor held on April 27th of last year, I actually reached out to Andrew Hevesy's office to try to get legal assistance for that woman I've never had any contact with. So the point is, if I took a proactive step, totally selfless, and I come to these meetings, I ask you guys to try to get this assistance for that woman, and nothing is done. The question is, how many more victims of judicial misconduct uh, do there need to be before somebody takes action? Thank you very much. That concludes our hearing. What? One minute. No, no, I, I, not because I don't love you. It's just because the hearing's over. <laughs> but that, that's okay. Don't that take a breath. Take a breath. Take a breath. I'm Kelly Grace Price Wait. from the Jails Action mm -hmm. Coalition. Slow down. Wait. Let's get one minute on the clock. Let's get two minutes on the clock. You get two minutes like you got two minutes. All right? Use the oath. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Wow, I do. I've never been sworn in at a hearing. I'm excited about well, this. Well, welcome to one of my hearings. Thank you, Councilman. Um, I Two do, minutes. I, and I do apologize for being late. We had a meeting with the Board of Correction this afternoon, the Jails Action Coalition, so I do apologize. I just um, wanted to say that I had missed the hearing that you had a few months ago about the IDV courts. And I'm sorry that I missed that because as a survivor of domestic violence and trafficking, Brian's heard my story many times. Cy Vance accused me with the now unconstitutional CPLR 240.30 threw me in Rikers Island, but before that, I was up in Judge Tondra Dawson's IDV part for two and a half years as the accused violator. And I would like <coughs> to um, just say that those IDV parts do not work. They specifically work when there is a, a designated batterer and a designated survivor. But those two tracks always get conflated in the criminal courts. Um, I could say a lot about this, but it's the end of your hearing, and I promised only to take a minute, but this is an issue I'd like to spend some time with you and with Rachel on, um, and I would just like to point out that when you get testimony from groups like Sanctuary for Families that are in lockstep with Cy Vance, you're only going to hear one side of the story. So thanks again for, for letting me testify at the end of your hearing, and thank you for <laughs> your service to the city of New York. Right, well, thank you for taking the time for being here, and we'll set up a time for you to talk with Rachel. And we would very much like to hear your perspective and your story. Thank you. That concludes the hearing. Thank you all very much.